Lore Together is proud to be part of the Boss Rush Games Network. Feel free to find out more at bossrushgames.com slash network. Hi, I'm Safi. And I'm Mystic. And this is Lore Together. This is a podcast where a husband and wife team go over all the storytelling, world building, and characters of video games because it's what we like to do together. We lore together. Yep. And this is episode 122. And if you don't like us by now, too bad. We've been doing it longer than most anything else we've done <laughs> other than, I guess, our marriage. Yeah. 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 I think we're pretty good at this by now. If you'd like to share your thoughts on that, you can do that in many different ways. Instagram, Blue Sky, Mastodon, Reddit, YouTube, Steam, and Discord down in the description. If you're going to contact us via email, you can do that at loretogether at gmail.com. And like support this crazy podcast we have. That we've been doing for a while, so we must be really good at it, right? <laughs> right. Obviously. You can do that in multiple different ways. First is through giving us a good review wherever you're listening. We appreciate it. The other way is through Patreon at patreon.com slash lore together. We can pay a per episode pledge to get early access to episodes, exclusive access to some Let's Plays, voting rights and other Let's Plays, and eventually audiobooks like Safi's reading of Primal Rage, Prophet's Power, right? No, Primal Rage, The Avatar. The Avatar. Sorry, Prophet's... Sorry, Prophet's Power is the unreal one that I'm supposed yeah, to be you're doing. you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to be a patron, you can vote in our chat and in our polls for our Mass Effect Let's Play, as well as what subsequent Let's Plays will be, mm-hmm. as well as the exclusive Let's Plays, such as Cyberpunk and Jade Empire that are ongoing currently mm-hmm. on the Patreon page. Exactly. So thank you, patrons, for all your support. Thank you, listeners, for just tuning in. We love hearing about how much you love our episodes. And speaking of which, we got to start this one now in earnest. And I technically kind of know what we're talking about, but I also forgot about what we were doing until literally a couple minutes before Mystic turned on the microphones. So this is version two of this episode because the original episode for 122 was also in the Halo franchise. Except back when we did episode 28, my notes were handwritten due to Little Buddy and my inability to get on a computer. Yes. And so I didn't have them. And I wrote a huge long episode and then realized more than half of it was already covered in episode 28. It's last night. It's before amazing. we recorded this. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm sorry, I kept interrupting you, but it's amazing the brain fog that results from having an infant in your lap. <laughs> Just and the thing, this is the thing that's hilarious about it. At that age, that is kind of when that their needs are the least complicated. I need a change. I need food. I need sleep. But also and the most frequent. They are also the most frequent, <laughs> and it is funny when you think back to how your brain worked then and this is especially true if you're the the one who gives birth but even if you're just existing in the same house as that right. the energy is just off so i'm not surprised that you forgot that she like in a fugue state you wrote this yeah so we i decided to stay within the same franchise to mm-hmm. save myself having to honestly the hardest thing half the time is picking what franchise or what game to cover for each episode that is days of thinking and ruminating and (laughs) so in the boss rush discord there was another person who's on a podcast that does lore deep dives and we like traded episodes as we 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 should listen to each other listen to each other's stuff and then i realized I can't listen to most of their stuff because Mystic might be covering that later. So yeah. the first one I did was I'll you know what and maybe in the the notes we'll give a shout out to them because I am totally spacing on the podcast mm-hmm. right now. But they did a they covered the the Blair Witch video game. So I was like, okay, that's usually not we usually don't do anything that's like linked to a franchise outside of just video games primarily. So. 
Yeah, we, I mean, I could do we, that one safely. We've talked about this. Like, we're probably not going to be covering The Witcher because it is based off of a series of books, mm. primarily. If mm-hmm. they have an offshoot of something that is not based off of other stuff, that's right. different. Like, we're not going to cover Goldeneye because it is a retelling of a movie. Yes. You know, we may, t- may big, <laughs> big B- May. Big if. Big, big if, if. That we might cover, like, a James Bond video game that is unique. To itself. To itself. Entirely. Um, yeah. So, Blair Witch, we're not <laughs> We want to. It is a different story than the movie, but also it's very much a sequel to the movie, so it does not stand alone. Right. So, we will not be touching that. But it, it puts me in this funny position where half the time also people will say, Safi, I think you'd like this video game. And Mystic's like... Safi, you cannot play this. We're going to cover this sometime in the future. But of course, it's like this vague idea of what the future is. Yeah. So I have to randomly claim the ones I'm like, I'm playing this game, Mystic, and I will cover it when it's time and you can't stop me. Mm. So still, still waiting on that spirit fair one. Anyway. You are lucky. I took a break from my writing and I covered anything about Dragon Age in the midst. Okay. Don't you get started. I am near the end of finally freaking writing over 400,000 words of what has become an epic fantasy series and I will be self-publishing it and you will rue the day. You will rue the day. So, so anyway, cast your minds back to January of 2021 and episode 28. That feels so long ago. <laughs> it feels, you know what? Here's here's the problem with how time is now. If you said if it was, hey, remember something in like 2017, I'd be like, oh, that's not that far away. If you tell me, remember something in 2020 or 2021? Oh, God, that's so long ago. Brain has stretched out the pandemic time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's how it is. But yes, yeah, so we are supposed to, to remember January 2021 episode 28 yep we covered some very very early history of halo with the ancient humans yeah uh, we're yeah. basically it's almost alternate history to help support the sci-fi setting entirely yeah. we barely touched the games themselves and it's time that we start that timeline and so we're gonna be covering two games here halo wars and halo reach okay so they're not the main stuff they are they are main well, well halo wars is not a it is a main line, but it's not first person shooter. That's I guess that's what I should say. It is not in the main vein of what the Halo series is about. Halo reaches. Yeah, it's considered one of the main lines. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay, that's just how consi- much I know about And they're all the considered series. canon. Even the as far as I know, even the arcade shooter, like there is an arcade rail shooter. Oh. That's I think it takes I didn't I didn't dive too deep into it, but I think it takes place during Halo three i could be wrong it could be halo one it takes place during one of the other halo games that is apparently canonical so that's a great thing when you create these unique sci-fi worlds that have these huge battles it's easy to have different perspectives of the same event and that can make interesting offshoot video games but that's not what we're talking about today we're talking about these two which I, I just think of the main, like, Halo and then, like, the sequels to the OG Halo yeah. specifically. But I, I guess I don't remember the names. And we're still not doing the multiplayer where we've turned to gravity low and we're running at each other with golf clubs. It's so the names are very simple. It's Halo Combat Evolved is the first one. Okay. And then Halo 2, Halo 3. <laughs> like, That's what I thought. They always have Halo 3, Halo 4, Halo 5. I think Halo Infinite's the most recent one. But... Oh, that's right, because when they were like, these numbers are getting boring. How do we make it exciting? Anyway, by the 26th century, humanity has expanded beyond the confines of Earth's solar system and now inhabits hundreds of worlds and other solar systems under the ultimate control of the Unified Earth Government and the United Nations Space Command. Okay, interesting. The Earth's government, military, and scientific arm. However, colonization did not come without its problems. By the late 25th century... Various rebel and secessionist forces, commonly known as insurrectionists, emerged in the outer colonies, actively opposing the UNSC-imposed rule on the outlying worlds. Now, is this like a Firefly slash Serenity situation where they were there was this idea of those outer outer 
kind of we're, being neglected essentially I, you know i don't know about that but it is more like we're out here we should be able to have lead our own lives type stuff mm-hmm. in 2517 the spartan 2 program was initiated by the unsc to counter the threat of an imminent all-out civil war in the outer colonies by producing a group of biologically enhanced super soldiers this can never go wrong. <laughs> in 2525, humanity made first contact with a powerful alien hegemony known as the Covenant on the distant farming world of Harvest. Following an unfortunate chain of events set in motion by the contact at Harvest, the Covenant's religious leaders deemed humans unclean beings and waged an all-out genocidal campaign with the intent of wiping the human race out of existence. Well, I guess you can justify anything if your holy people say that it's for the good of your spiritual path. Yeah. I don't I don't like saying that, but it's it's historically heads played out that way many times. Yeah. Um what did we do you remember what we did that was so unclean? We're just beneath them. As far as I remember. It's because we eat through our mouths, isn't it? <laughs> no, they have mouths. They have blah, like they have weird yeah. I know, but do they eat through them? I do not know, actually. I didn't look into the biology of the beings. <laughs> I'm just, I just, it was a running gag at a, at a series of videos once that, like, there was a alien that was reviewing movies and it would censor any time somebody was eating with their mouth because <laughs> it was considered offensive to all the other alien races. That was, was a great running joke, in my opinion. In Sorry. 2531... The UNSC Spirit of Fire is sent to assist the crippled marathon-class heavy cruiser, the UNSC Prophecy, in the Epsilon Indy system. Captain James Cutter orders the Prophecy's navigation database and survivors to be recovered, sending Sergeant John Forge and multiple Marine fire teams on board the vessel while Spirit of Fire engages several Covenant ships. Forge's Pelican dropship ends up being hit by enemy fire and crash lands on the Prophecy's hull. Forge and Team Lima breach and board the Prophecy by deploying a soft seal. However, they are attacked by Covenant troops. Forge's ankle is broken during the engagement. Uh Uh-oh. With the guidance of Serena, Spirit of Fire's AI, and... The AIs get a little weird here. Serena looks like you'd expect female dressed in a... Sailor's out, not sailor's we're, outfit, but soldier's outfit. Because we're familiar with Cortana, right? Yeah, we'll get to her in the next game. Yeah. But, yeah, Serena is what you picture, picturing a personified Siri or whatever. Yes. So, with the guidance of Serena, Spirit of Fire's AI, Forge is able to find a terminal to recover the ship's black box and wipe its navigation core while the rest of the team rescue the ship's survivors. Serena warns him that the Prophecy's AI may act peculiar due to high radiation levels. Upon scanning his retina to gain access to the terminal, Forge is halted by the Prophecy's AI, Fitzgibbon, who looks like a jaunty admiral. It's... (laughs) So I think this was the first. This was the first round of development, and they realized, well, they they ex- they respect like older masculine figures. That's what we should go with, and not realize it looks like we took Admiral Bobbery or Bobbery Bombery from Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door and made him human. Like just, it looks ridiculous to me. Eventually, the strange AI allows Forge into the terminal room, and he enables the radiation repair routines. Forge purges the navigation database and returns to his dropship as Fitzgibbon activates Prophecy's self-destruct sequence, which soon scuttles the ship. By the mm. way, this we're not even into the game yet. This is all before the game starts. This is a lot of preface of stuff that you're not doing yet. What so the heck? they had so this is Halo Wars Genesis, kind of like Mass Effect Genesis, where you're watching a basically a comic. Okay. Yeah. Or it is a comic. I can't remember the, but yeah, it's comic book panels essentially. Mm-hmm. After the Marines and Forge escape with the survivors, they are all taken to Spirit of Fire's medical bay. When Forge inquires how the survivors are doing, Serena informs them that they will all soon die due to all of them suffering extensive radiation poisoning. Forge is understandably angry at the AI's indifference toward the survivors and goes to comfort them in their final moments. Yeah, that makes sense. That's awful. Yep. Then we get to 
actual game. Forge is then sent to the surface of Harvest on his first mission to scout out Covenant activity. I'm sorry. I have to say. It's a farming planet. And <laughs> they named it Harvest. So the names in Halo always throw me a little bit because ship names like Spirit of Fire. Okay. That's sounds- Pillar of Autumn. Like they these are the ship names that the humans have decided upon. Come on, guys. <laughs> there's better this is- I'm fine with it. I usually don't critique ship ma- names. There's something about the writing process where most of the time when people are naming ships the logic will make sense. I mean, the weirdest thing I could think of was when they when they named stuff like shuttle ships off of rivers in, um, in Star Trek. Nine. Yeah, in yeah. Star Trek. But at the same time, like, I'm sorry. There's a colony that's just named Harvest. Like, at least Eden Prime makes sense. There's a colony Harvest. There's a colony Reach. There's, yeah, there's... <laughs> Yeah, it seems really simplistic, and I don't know. I feel like whenever it's interesting because a lot of times in these sci-fi stories, we kind of harken back to these like grand ideas from the times of mythology. Like I would imagine something being named like you know this colony is called being called Demeter or something like that. But instead, here we are, harvest. That's so lame, guys. Sorry. But he is to scout out Covenant activity in the northern polar region of the planet. While on patrol, Alpha Base is attacked and destroyed by the Covenant, with its survivors fleeing into the countryside. After rounding up the survivors, Forge leads them into an assault to take back Alpha Base and gets it back to fully operational status. Buoyed by this first success, Forge then leads an assault on a nearby Forerunner relic site, a huge underground structure. Forerunners are... <laughs> So if you go back in time, you have the you have the precursors who then seeded the galaxies, mm-hmm. and humans are one of their races. And in fact, they're chosen ones to be the guardians of life. Forerunners thought that they were the chosen, and that's led to a hu- ancient human forerunner conflict. And yeah, so the forerunners are technologically advanced. They don't exist anymore as far as i'm aware i could be wrong on that but uh so it's a that was a past conflict that shapes current undertones okay his team removes the covenant occupants and secures the site for professor ellen anders examination so ellen anders and john forge uh are not on great terms they bicker constantly she finds his being assigned to her as as her minder funny Oh, (laughs) and he just feels he's a glorified babysitter whose charge is constantly putting herself in danger. Fair. (laughs) This is, does this become an enemies to lovers trope? No. Okay, cool. It become, it becomes a, a respect, like growing respect. Okay. Enemies to, to friends, to enemies to respect. Yeah. Like I'm annoyed with you and then I'm sorry, I've been in the writing space. So tropes are like. Like, being flung at me left and right. Oh, we're going to have a big trope later on in Halo Reach that we are going to call out. Oh, so. I can't wait. I'm excited. I even quote, I'm even going to quote TV tropes. They'll be great. Yes. Oh, man. I can't wait. Okay. I got I to gotta be quiet more if I'm going to get to this. <laughs> Battle-wise, there's a bit of back and forth here as a Covenant cuts them off. And then another group from the Spirit of Fire pushes through the Covenant lines. We're not going to cover all the back and forth in detail. We know how RTS games work with the lore. We've done these before with Command and Conquer and more recently Homeworld. Yes, that's true. Information gathered from the Harvest Relic basically is a star map which shows that the Covenant has been heading out to a second UNSC colony, Arcadia, which is a better name. Yes, I would agree. (laughs) Upon following the Covenant to Arcadia, Spirit of Fire's crew find that most of the orbital defenses have either been destroyed or damaged in a battle with the Covenant. Mm -hmm. Forge and his forces are deployed to the ground in order to assist the Spartans of Red Team in an effort to evacuate civilians from Perth City, spelled P-I-R-T-H. And for the children who are not aware, this reminds me of the online series Red vs. Blue, where there was a Red Team and a Blue Team based yeah. on like the Halo multiplayer. Yeah. So kind of... It's, it's interesting to think about how popular that is. Or was back then? 
I, I honestly wonder if it's still going. I don't even know. I stopped watching it Years over ago. a decade ago now. I have a feeling it might still be. I'll have, we'll have to look it up later. I it went it went for a lot longer than I thought it would. I'll yeah. tell you that it went for a long time. Afterward, the UNSC forces withdraw to a defensible area on the city outskirts, holding off Covenant attacks long enough for Spartan Team Omega to arrive and assist. While all of this is going on, the Covenant have erected a large energy shield generator around a site of importance with undiscovered ruins surrounding the area. After a ton of back and forth with heavy units and a and big threats that we don't really have to get into. Mm -hmm. Anders and Forge begin documenting the era only for Arbiter Ripa Umorame. Apostrophe M O R A M E E. Umorame? Umorame? It's hard because yeah. the leading apostrophe throws me. Taking Anders prisoner and wounding Forge, with Red Team arriving too late to assist. The Covenant Arbiter takes Anders aboard a starship and makes a hasty retreat out of the system with the Spirit of Fire following, eventually emerging in orbit over a mysterious planet called Trove. Who named it Trove? At this point, it's just called Mysterious Planet. I'm calling it Trove because that's what it's called later. Did the humans name it? I do not have that information. Okay. I, I just want to judge. I just want to know who am I judging? How am I judging in this moment? You're not going to get an answer. No. De deploying ground forces to search for Andrews, the UNSC and Covenant forces come under attack from a previously undiscovered alien organism, the Flood. Wait, what? The alien organism is called the Flood? We talked about this in episode 28. They are essentially a really weird genetic leftover of the precursors. Oh. That is almost infectious. So we did talk about this in episode 28, which is why my original thing was going to be about the flood. And then I realized, oh, we covered the origin of the flood. Never mind. Okay. But to recap slightly, the precursors died off. They go into hibernation. The hibernation breaks down their cells. They want to reanimate. Never happens. Their ancient humans find the canisters, decide to start experimenting with it on their pets it makes them docile. They're like, this is great. And then generations later, the pets start growing weird tendrils and stuff. And that becomes the first flood because, yeah, it basically mutates them at a genetic level and yeah. it becomes a creeping horror thing. So. I barely remember that. But okay. Maybe we'll go be deeper into the flood another time. Okay. Oh, that's very poetic the way you said it. Oh, jeez. Spirit of Fire manages to enter... <laughs> I like how you're mad at yourself for being poetic. Spirits of Fire manages to to enter proceeding through a docking system, removing flood growths and moving through a system of concentric rings that filters out all flood biomasses. Basically, the forerunners were not huge fans of the flood. Okay. And yeah, so Spirit of Fire then emerges inside a massive shield world, immediately engaging a Covenant destroyer and fending off attacks while conducting repairs. Meanwhile... The Arbiter uses Anders to activate an installation known as the Apex Site, revealing a fleet of Forerunner warships which the Covenant plan on using against humanity. Oh no! Anders is forced to activate the Forerunner ships, and while the Arbiter is speechifying to his fellow Covenant, Anders manages to escape using what had been her stasis prison as a translocation device, teleporting herself to the surface of the shield world's interior and linking up with forge and his marines who clear the area of covenant forces and establish a base of operations on the shield world anders saving the day with science one plot hole at a time removing the spirit of fire's ftl drive whoa the unsc move it to the apex planning to detonate it the chain reaction will send the shield world sun into a supernova destroying the installation and the fleet denying it to the covenant and saving humanity from near total defeat and extinction are you sure you want to explode the sun that feels like a <laughs> very hasty decision right now there's it, it just i mean you, you should ask jean gray how that went for her just like taking people's sons not a great idea the arbiter attempts to stop them but his elites are killed by red team and forge manages to kill the arbiter with one of his own energy swords hmm. and those energy swords in halo they are pretty cool looking they are pretty cool looking not as cool though as the golf club 
During the fighting, the FTDL drive was damaged. There's no way to remote detonate it, so Forge stays behind to detonate the reactor, while the rest of the UNSC forces activate a portal out of the shield world, ev evacuate to the ship of fire, and <laughs> through crazy AI shenanigans... You said ship of fire, you mean spirit of fire? Spirit of fire, yes. Okay. And managed to slingshot around the sun to build up enough speed to escape the supernova's blast radius and the range of the shield world's debris. Unable to return to human space, as their FTL drive is Busted. no more, Yeah. the crew enter cryonic storage. The ship begins her long journey home, setting a course for the colony Reach, likely to take many years or decades. Forge's cryotube is closed by Captain Cutter, who briefly nods, acknowledging the sergeant's sacrifice. On February 10th, 2534, the UNSC declares the vessel lost with all hands, though some of the families of the crew refuse to believe it. Well, right. There's no proof. We will eventually catch back up with them in Halo Wars 2, but that is way down the timeline. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so that whole story is a precursor for a game we're not even covering in this episode. Correct. That is Halo Wars, the first one, which is an RTS. That okay. is apparently pretty decent. That Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. But I know you love RTSs when we're streaming, so we will move on to the next game in the franchise momentarily. Oh, I appreciate that my husband you know, accepts my weaknesses for what they are. During all that fighting, yes, that's why I'm going to send more uh, stealth games at you soon, too. No! <laughs> Nobody asked for this. Nobody wins when you do this, Mystic. <laughs> Nobody. During all that fighting the Spirit of Fire was dealing with, the UNSC initiated another super soldier project known as the Spartan 3 program. It, it's Spartan 2, but one better. The Spartan 3 commandos, <laughs> while greater in numbers than the Spartan 2s, were created to assault high-value targets en masse. In suicide missions in which they often succeeded at the cost of entire companies. <laughs> Yeah, that seems, that seems wrong-headed in so many different ways. Yes. However, despite their best efforts, humanity could only slow down the Covenant's advance. By 2552, virtually all of the outer colonies have been devastated by the Covenant, who now ravaged the inner colonies. Yikes. Reach remains as humanity's last military stronghold and is often considered the only thing that stands between the Covenant and Earth. So we begin Halo Reach. Wow. Bad, uh... We didn't see that happening. So wait a second. <laughs> mm. Our answer, it's just the parallels between the war strategy in Halo and the civilization strategy in the paranoia TTRPG <laughs> are way too close for comfort. The idea Friend that Cortana. <laughs> like, the idea that, like, everybody has a six-pack of clones <laughs> just ready to go, it, it just, it, you know, it just doesn't feel right. It just, it's, it seems wrong. A little dystopian. Yeah. Even, it's giving dystopia right there. So, on July 24th, 2552, Spartan B312, the player character, arrives at UNSC Outpost on Reach. What a catchy name. So, they all have that. Is this like Finn from uh, the Star Wars sequels? I don't remember what that whole thing was. But yeah, if you remember, you may not remember, uh, Master Chief is, I think, John 117. Okay. So they all have names and yeah. Okay. So it's a name and then a thing. Yeah. At least they have a name and then a not number. Not always. Apparently. Spartan B312. Um, there was a, it was in the Star Wars sequels. Finn was originally something like F dash one nine, something like that, or okay. something like that. So, and then that's, and then Poe gives him the nickname Finn, and Fair. that's a huge deal. I vaguely remember that. I only saw that mm -hmm. movie once. It is here that the players are introduced to their main cast and given their first mission from Noble Team's commanding officer, Colonel Urban Holland. Oh. Spartan B312 is henceforth called Noble Six. Okay. And you can customize Noble Six in the way you can customize all Spartans. You're not doing face. Well, I think you can do face stuff in some of them, but you're basically just decking out their armor. Right, exactly. So, 
The team is called to investigate the sudden blackout in the Vicegrad Relay, one of the planet's primary communication hubs. Expecting a confrontation with insurrectionists, the team lands in the remote rural areas and proceeds to the Relay. So, <laughs> even though we talked about the insurrectionists before, and there's been a massive alien threat since then, the insurrectionists are still a thing <laughs> and still fighting. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Despite the huge aliens bent on destroying all humanity that are rampaging across the entire galactic empire. This like, is like <laughs> the beginning of, of Star Trek. I'm, everything's reminding me of Star Trek now because we're insane. But this reminds me of the beginning of Star Trek Voyager <laughs> where we still had the, what was that? The Maquis. The Maquis. Why? Are, look, why are the Maquis still going to be a threat when you are 70 years away from Federation space? Honestly, that's a bad play. Oh, yeah. At that they, point, like, why, what, any allegiances you have are, that, are gone, even to the Federation after, to a certain extent. That whole arc came back three times, I think. And it, because it was, it was not a enough, bad idea. Not enough to waste an entire whole bit of DS9 making that just so that they could, yeah, it was a bad idea. Oh, no, the Maki were not necessarily the worst idea. Either. Putting them in Voyager was the bad idea. Making it a crux point of yeah. Voyager was a bad idea. Anyway. That's exactly it. Let's well, moving on. After interrogating a farmer and finding suspicious signs in there, it is soon discovered that the loss of communications is the work of, surprise, surprise, the Covenant, and the team is quickly engaged by Covenant ground forces. Why do I feel like suddenly a bunch of aliens pop out and say nobody expects the Inquisition? <laughs> After they have made their way into the relay station, they are attacked by elite Covenant soldiers who are on a mission to steal information from said relay. After the who would have guessed? Yeah, after the team successfully secures the station, the team uses the damaged relay to contact Colonel Holland and explain the situation, leading to the declaration of the planetary emergency directive, Winter Contingency, which basically is called when Covenant are on a UNSC colony world. Can, can I also just say briefly... What is the deal with the sci-fi video game plots almost always, whenever, I should say, in a military plot revolving around a relay? If you're doing a military plot, a relay is going to be part of your communications network, so it yeah. makes sense to reinforce it and secure it or protect it. But even like a Mass Effect is a relay, and it's not even a relay specifically for that purpose. It's an ancient relay, so to speak. I don't know. It just seems interesting that this keeps coming up again and again and again. I understand what you're saying that like in a military thing, it makes sense. But sometimes it's not a military relay. It's it's an interesting. That being said, it could also just be a catch all term. Like that's, that's fair. I might be overthinking. Literally, it. you turn your computer on again and off again. And then in Star Trek, it's have you tried reversing the polarity and switching it back again? Like. <laughs> True. I understand. Okay. Two days later, on July 26th, Noble Team is called to ONI Sword Bay. I think I think it's ONI or ONI. I don't know, but it's Office of Naval Intelligence. Okay. I think they shorten it as ONI, but I could be wrong. It's been a long time since I played Halo Reach. That's fair. It's been around for a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, near the Babbed Katha Ice Shelf. As explained to the team by the AI, Anti-Dot. No. Because the AI names in Halo are just... All over the place. Wait, why is there no consistency with this? Cortana, sophisticated. Serena. 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 Yeah, that's also somewhat sophisticated. What What was that? Fitzgibbon. Fitzgibbon. Comical? Auntie Dot. What? <laughs> I am immediately offended. Immediately offended. I don't even know if I should be, but with a name like that, preemptively, I'm going to be offended. Auntie Dot, what the heck is this? Well, the reasoning for it is is probably because, like, Auntie Dot is a cutesy name. It's usually just called Dot. It is a bunch of dots. It doesn't have a human form like the other ones does. Well, yeah, so in this case, it makes it Dot. Yeah, but Don't they call, call it Auntie Dot. Auntie Dot. Uh, yeah. Auntie Dot. <laughs> that just feels wrong. Like, why? <laughs> I there's just. Too many times where something was given a cutesy name with the endearment of aunt before it that wasn't actually that cutesy <laughs> and was actually very problematic in the long run. So we'll, we'll just move on. We'll just move on. 
Okay. Uh, sword base is under attack from a Covenant Corvette, but due to the sensitive nature of the facility, the use of orbital strikes is prohibited. Noble team clears the main courtyard of enemies and is sent on a mission to reactivate Farragut Station, a communication station that they can use to get into contact with command, and then they move on to Airview Base, where they need to activate anti-air batteries to clear the skies. Okay. The Spartans move into Sword Base, and Noble Six assists Emil, a.k.a. Noble Four, in driving off several Phantoms and Banshees. After the skies have been cleared, the UNSC sends a pair of longsword strike fighters to push the Covenant Corvette away from the base's immediate vicinity. The Covenant vessel begins to retreat, only to be shot out of the sky by an orbital strike. Oh, no. After the mission, Noble Team is debriefed by Dr. Catherine Halsey, who inquires as to the death of one of her scientists who was doing research at the relay. She says he mentioned a latchkey discovery and that the information was essential. Learning that he was killed by zealots, high-ranking Covenant warriors, Halsey reprimands Carter, Noble One, for not pursuing the leader, as the scientist's research was potentially important to understanding the Covenant religion. Mm. Fortunately, Cat, Noble Two, had stolen the data module off of the scientist and hands it over to Halsey. And no, the numbers don't follow their individual rank, though Noble One is a commander, Noble Two is a lieutenant commander, Noble 3, Noble 4, and Noble 5 are all warrant officers, placing them at a lower rank than Noble 6's lieutenant. So they all just, it's all just essentially, this is when we spit you out of the machine? This is when you joined the team. Okay. Yeah. All right. Noble 6 is there replacing the former Noble 6. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Two and a half weeks later, Noble 6 and June, Noble 3, are sent to perform night reconnaissance mission to reconnoiter the Covenant Dark Zone in the Viri territory, V-I-E-R-Y. Wait, recon... Reconnoiter. Reconnaissance, basically. Okay, yeah. okay. After stealthily eliminating guards at multiple outposts, the two Spartans meet up with a group of civilian militia men who guide them to a hydro plant further in the Dark Zone, where the team discovers a Covenant stealth pylon, which can hard large areas from sensors. After planting an explosive charge on the pylon, the team moves deeper into the dark zone where they discover a massive Covenant invasion force. Cat then orders them back so they can prepare the attack on the next day. Mm, that's fair, but now they have the intel at least. In the morning of August 12th, 2552, a massive UNSC joint assault force is put together with the objective of mounting a counterattack on the Covenant-occupied Viri territory. As revealed by Anti Dot in the mission briefing, oh, geez, okay. the Covenant have infiltrated the region in force, deploying ground forces and installations, including several massive deployment spires. These things are basically large and do shields and stuff. Okay. Noble Team's objective is to destroy one of these spires, designated Spire 1. After pushing through Covenant forces and destroying several Covenant anti air batteries, Jorge. Noble 5 and Noble 6 deploy to the Spire in a Falcon, which is kind of like a heavy helicopter. Mm -hmm. However, the aircraft crashes after being disabled by the electromagnetic field created by the Spire's shield. After the crash, the pair proceed to, into the Spire, where it is revealed that the Spire actually contains teleporters used to transport Covenant forces to the surface. Oh. Okay. After proceeding to the Spire, Noble 6 utilizes a gravity lift to reach the top, basically elevator and disables the shield noble six is then flown away from the tower by a falcon containing carter and jorge after they are clear the unsc grafton a heavy frigate fires around from its magnetic accelerator cannon demolishing the spire Woohoo! unfortunately seconds later a covenant supercarrier uncloaks and fires on the grafton completely destroying it oh come on uh, okay. I mean, I understand we have to up the stakes, but that just feels lame. Hey, we're here to save today. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Noble team contemplates how to destroy the Covenant supercarrier called Long Night of Solace, as the UNSC no longer possesses tactical nuclear devices on reach. Instead, Cat proposes they use a slip space drive as a makeshift bomb to destroy the ship. We also get some character building for our player character here as a becomes apparent that Noble Six was a pilot in the top-secret Sabre program at some point. Mm. Carter contacts Colonel Holland, and the plan is approved. The Sabre, by the way, is a highly classified planetary defense fighter craft. So, oh. good pilot. <laughs> On August 14th, Noble Team arrives at the Sabre program launch research range, 
where Noble Six and Jorge commandeer the UNS... C YSS 1000 Saber, a recent development intended for inner colony orbital defense. What an inspiring name. They launch into the hostile space overreach where they protect a UNSC space station, Anchor 9, until its defenses come back online. Next, they rendezvous with the UNSC Savannah, which sacrifices its slip space drive for their mission. Oh. They then board the Covenant Corvette Ardent Prayer. How many nouns are you going to be throwing at me for ships and frigates and all that stuff? Yes. By ah. this point in the fighting, gravity and atmosphere on the Ardent Prayer have been deactivated, leaving any Covenant on board without a sealed suit, dead and floating. The Noble Team uses the Ardent Prayer's refueling course at the supercarrier as an excuse to get close enough to detonate the subspace bomb and destroy the Long Night of Solace. Oh, wow. Unfortunately... The detonator for the makeshift bomb is damaged, and Jorge is forced to manually detonate it, sacrificing himself to destroy the supercarrier. Not Jorge! This is a trope the series will use again and again, four times in this game alone. And when I say we'll use again and again, I didn't even mention that Noble Six, the one that we're replacing, hand-delivered a tactical nuke to a Covenant ship and blew it and himself up. TV Tropes literally says, Reach is made of heroic sacrifice. How many heroic sacrifices does it take to make a sandwich in the Halo universe? <laughs> that's really that's really the question we're answering here. However, the victory is short-lived, another trope. Mere moments later, uh, a massive Covenant fleet arrives, making the destruction of one supercarrier pointless. There's a better way to write this. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't mean that the story isn't interesting or compelling, especially because in a video game you're actually... A doing something yes so it's easy and we are doing very broad strokes to a degree. yeah like we are to a degree so like these kind of repetitions kind of easily get missed when you're like adrenaline rush experiencing the game plus there's a lot more character building with our characters because we get combat dialogue we get cutscenes with them we get all that yeah stuff. but the fact that the heroic sacrifice and then the surprise your sacrifice didn't mean much or like you, yeah. surprise you weren't as prepared as you thought. I'm sure there's another name for that trope seems to keep happening again and again. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. This game in particular, like I said, Yikes. <laughs> really is Noble Six is flung away from the core of it by Jorge falling all the way down into Reach's atmosphere saved by their reentry pack. After landing, Six continues to the city of New Alexandria, arriving there on August 23rd. Six does a lot of missions to help the war effort in the city and help the civilians back and forth, back and forth. Okay, a little before, sense of normalcy before some big stuff, I'm yeah, assuming. before finally being brought back into the Noble Team. Cat orders Noble Six to assist in the destruction of several Covenant communication jammers in the area, along with several other tasks, including protecting Gunnery Sergeant Edward Buck's Falcon as he is transported to the rest of his unit defending different groups of army soldiers around the city and assisting in a more civilian evacuation. Basically, lots of good guy building. Good. Oh, look at yeah. this guy. He's such a good guy. Let's yeah. do the good guy things with him because he's such a good guy. Yeah. And definitely better than the, than the soldiers in Spec Ops The Line. Oh, dude. <laughs> I am still... Reco I mean... <laughs> I'm still recovering from that game. I have not recovered from that game in any way, shape, or form. Kat then calls on Noble Six to come to her aid in the evacuation of the of Office of Naval Intelligence HQ. Once inside, Noble Team is reunited in what Emil calls a family reunion. Colonel Holland makes emergency contact to the team, ordering them to immediately redeploy to Sword Base again, this time to destroy sensitive information. Okay. The communications are cut off, and June notes several Covenant vehicles leaving the area. Soon afterward, the Covenant begin to glass the city near the building, generating a massive shock wave that Noble Team barely manages to avoid. Hmm. The team takes an elevator down to the bottom level where they run to an underground radiation bunker as Carter explains that there are to be redeployed to Sword Base to destroy all sensitive data. Just before they get inside, Cat is killed with a single shot from a needle rifle to the back of her head. Three days later, the team exits the shelter and a pelican arrives to transport them to Sword Base. Wait, wait. Can you, uh, I'm, I'm having a hard time keeping up because there's so much going on. It's a lot of run and gun, a lot of big attacks, and dwindling down our team members. <sighs> okay. Yeah. We've lost Jorge. We've lost Cat. Not Cat. No. And we will be losing more. 
No, this is this is why I can't play games like this. I don't want to be this broken at the end. This is, so it's funny. This is very much Star Wars Rogue One. <laughs> this okay. Is, yeah. This does not end on a good note. For, oh, jeez. Yeah. Who's whose dad is the reason they have the secret and, plans? <laughs> <laughs> not that much like it. <laughs> this does dovetail. We'll see at the end with the first Halo game. So okay. there, there is a, a cross over. On August 29th, Noble Six is deployed with a group of orbital drop shock troopers, which ODST, that's another Halo game, in yes. order to take out several Covenant anti-air towers around Sword Base, opening the defenses so the rest of Noble Team can be deployed to the base via Falcons. After fighting their way into Sword Base, Noble Team discovers that the coordinates they were given are empty and stand full of dead troopers. Oh, no. The coordinates are then revised by an unknown AI, and Noble Team moves into caves below Sword Base. What is going to be the crazy name for this AI? And if you say something like Bojangles, I'm leaving (laughs) the room. We are done with the episode. (laughs) Noble Team rides a cart down the tunnel and discovers that it was Dr. Halsey who ordered them back to the base, not Colonel Holland, despite the existence of reports that she had died. As they descend down the elevator, a massive artifact, a huge Forerunner ship, is revealed. Whoa! Halsey asks Noble Team to buy her more time in order to decrypt the artifact's data. Noble Team sets up a defensive perimeter at the entrance to Halsey's lab, fighting off waves of incoming Covenant. Mm -hmm. After the process is complete, Noble Team falls back to Halsey's lab, where she then shows a fragment of the AI Cortana to the team and explains that she has been assigned the custodian of the artifact's data. And she needs to be brought to the Asazad ship breaking yards. I think that's how that's pronounced. I don't know what to do with the accent over the over the <laughs> Z. So. Oh, I don't know either. That's uh, that's not what I'm familiar with. Sorry. But Cortana has to be brought there in order to be deployed on a UNSC Halcyon class light cruiser, which is being sent on a special mission. Dr. Halsey explains that Cortana has picked Noble Six to be her carrier and entrust her to the Spartan. Oh wow! Okay. They make their way to the landing pad outside where two Pelican dropships await. June is assigned by Carter to take one of the Pelicans to escort Dr. Halsey to Castle Base while the rest of the team deploys on the other dropship to the shipbreaking yards. On the way, the Pelican piloted by Carter is damaged, forcing Emil and Noble Six to initiate a low-level altitude aerial insertion and move towards the UNSC Pillar of Autumn. Mm. The pair are blocked by a Scarab, a massive Covenant siege weapon. In fact, you you've seen this when we played Halo, I'm sure. I think so. But Carter arrives and sacrifices himself, piloting the Pelican in a kamikaze strike on the Scarab. No more sacrificing yourselves, guys. We've had enough of it for one game. Come not, on. Nope, not done yet. No. Noble Six and Emil continue towards the Pillar of Autumn. Once there, Emil mans a magnetic accelerator cannon and fires on orbital ships, while Noble Six fights off masses of Covenant infantry. Ah. Captain Jacob Keyes then arrives and receives the Cortana AI shard from Noble Six. Before the captain can take off, however, a Covenant battle cruiser arrives and prepares to fire on the Pillar of Autumn. Mm. Meanwhile, Covenant forces are dropping on Emil's location. Emil kills one with a shotgun before being stabbed through the abdomen by another. No! The Marines on Key's dropship offer that Noble Six board the Pelican, but Six declines, as without cover from the magnetic accelerator cannon that Emil was manning, the Pillar of Autumn can't escape. Right, that's fair. After fighting through the Zealots, Noble Six takes controls of the cannon and defends the Pelican as it returns to the Autumn. As the Covenant battlecruiser ship prepares to fire, Noble Six fires into its main weapon, disabling the cruiser as the Pillar of Autumn escapes the planet. Heck he is. The final cutscene portrays the beginning of the opening cutscene in Halo Combat Evolved, where the Pillar of Autumn comes out of slip space. Keys asks if they evaded the Covenant, to which Cortana replies, I think we both know the answer to that. Mm-hmm. The credits roll on right as the ship drifts off towards Installation 4, which is where Halo 1 begins. Mm-hmm. After the credits, Noble Six is shown to be still at the shipbreaking yards, preparing for a final stand against Covenant forces being deployed in the area. Six fights off several waves of Covenant forces before succumbing to plasma fire, discarding his or her damaged helmet. Six fights desperately with several soldiers until overwhelmed and stabbed by a zealot's energy dagger. The epilogue, set over 30 years later in the year 2589, and over a decade after all the games so far, 
Oh, wow. On a re-terraformed reach shows Noble Six's helmet sitting on what is now a grassy field. Dr. Halsey provides a eulogy to Noble Team as the camera shows a human ship landing on the planet showing the recolonization of Reach. No. I hate stories that end like that, though. <laughs> and they usually don't tell you they're going to end like that until you find them. And then it's just like, guys, could some could somebody please live? I just I just love hope. I'm always for hope. Um, but I will say, at least overall, it's not like humanity won the war. It's just its battle was lost. It's just sad. Wow, I'm not going to remember any of the ship names or anything. <laughs> like, th- this feels, and it could be just the way that you delivered it, but the amount of nouns that were just spat at me this episode, just like left and right, and we're only relevant for a sentence or two, and then we moved on. Yeah. And Insane. so June so June survives and is in the Spartan 4 project, and yeah. there's, um, I forget if. I can't remember the other one's name. I don't think we... They don't all die, but it's like you get a good chunk of noble team dying. So Yikes. Yeah, that still stinks, man. So you're going to play some Halo Reach. Yes, because we are not going to suffer through me playing an RTS if we don't have to. Unless <laughs> if it's something like Command and Conquer... Co- Wait, was it? Red uh, Alert. Red Alert. I was about to say Code Red. I'm like, no, that's a Mountain Dew flavor. <laughs> <laughs> um okay so we're gonna we're gonna play some halo reach yep and that'll be the thursday after this airs to the public yep alternate thursdays we're, we're doing on, mass effect at the beginning two. of mass effect 2 still still well it's not really i mean we've we're we're getting there we're we're probably gonna have one more team member after the next the next one, which mm. will air the Thursday before this releases to the public. And if you want to see what we've been up to with that, all of them are available on our YouTube channel, yep. along with everything we did before, which if you wanted to play, but you don't have the time, and you but you're willing to listen to us do our live streams of the other games we did, which includes Skies of Arcadia, Firewatch, everybody's Abduction, Abduction Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. That's it. There's one more. Tacoma. Tacoma, yeah. We did Tacoma. Um, so those are all there. But otherwise, the Thursday after this airs to the public, watch me play Halo Reach, and we hope to see you there. Yep. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, guys. We'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye.